I just want to talk in this video about how to apply Pascal's law to a hydraulic cylinder. I'm going to, we're going to talk about some example uh, forces and pressures that could uh, be exerted from or applied to a cylinder to overcome a load. And we'll just talk about the relationship between force, pressure, and area. Using this particular hydraulic cylinder as an example, I started disassembling it here. We'll take it apart and we'll talk about where effective areas are in this type of cylinder, which is an unbalanced double acting cylinder. The most common type we're gonna find on mobile equipment. So I've removed the rod and piston and the gland from the barrel assembly. So we're looking at our rod pack where we've got the rod with the gland on it, the piston, and this particular cylinder has a nut retaining the piston to the rod. Some will have a bolt, um, but we'll talk about why that has no real consequence. So when we talk about effective area in a cylinder, um, we're talking about where oil under pressure can push to effectively move the rod and piston. So if we're going to extend a cylinder, the effective area is the circular shape underneath this piston. So effectively we're dealing with a circle and oil can push on that circular area to move the piston and rod out. Now when you look at all the profiles here, you've got a hexagon of a nut and you've got all the threads and it can get a little bit confusing. Isn't oil going to push it you know, on all these angles as well? And do we have to do any kind of particular math to calculate all the some of these areas? And the answer is no, because again, effective area is only the area where oil is going to push to extend the cylinder. And when you're extending this rod pack, it's moving at it's moving in a linear fashion. So oil only oil pushing at 90 degrees uh, to the nut or in line axially, axially to the uh, rod is going to do any effective motion. So we can consider, we can ignore all the profile and relief on here. We can just consider this a circular piston. So we're going to use the area of a circle to figure out the effective area on this side of the piston. Uh, for a double acting cylinder, uh, we have to look at the construction and realize that when oil is coming in this so when oil comes in this work port and comes into this end it's coming in between the gland and the piston and filling this volume of the cylinder and pushing on this surface of the piston which is not a circle it's an annulus or a donut shape it's only a ring of area because the rod of course is covering much of the surface area on this side of the piston the oil can push against the rod, but that's not effective in moving the cylinder. So that's not effective area. So when we talk about hydraulics and we're talking about force pressure and area in an unbalanced cylinder like this, a double acting cylinder where we've got two different effective areas, we're going to have two different potentials for force and we're going to have two different calculations as far as the relationship between force pressure and area. So um, we're dealing with a circle on this side. We're dealing with an annulus or a donut shape on this side. How much difference there is in area from one side to the, of the piston to the other, it depends on the particular cylinder and how what the diameter of the rod is. The larger the rod is, the, the greater the difference is between the area on this side of the piston and the area on this side of the piston. But we'll talk about some simple ways to do the math and calculate those areas. So we're gonna measure this particular cylinder and we'll find out what the uh, what the effective areas are on both sides of the piston. So to get a more accurate measurement on this particular uh, cylinder, I'm going to measure the diameter of the piston. And I'm not using I'm not using precision measuring tools here, just with a tape measure and a, uh, a caliper that I've got. You know, I'm going to measure that and I've done the measurements and I found out that the diameter of that piston, which is the same effectively as the diameter of the bore of the tube or barrel, because of course the piston seal itself fits snugly in between. That's in this case uh, three and three quarter inches. So 3.75 inch piston diameter. 
So I've just made a record of that. And then I'm gonna measure the rod diameter. And on this cylinder, the rod diameter is two inches. Again, I just put the caliper over it, measured the opening of the caliper, and there's our dimensions. So we're gonna use those, we're gonna take them and do some math to figure out the areas. So I've just redrawn the, uh, the rod pack very crudely here, but just pointing out the diameter of that piston at 3.75 inches. And now let's convert that into an area. So there's a couple of different area formulas we could use, but we're, lo we're looking at the area of a circle and we're gonna try and figure out how many square inches there are on something that's round. So a couple of common formulas for figuring out area. We can use area equals pi r squared, or we could use area equals pi d squared over four. You can pick either of those formulas we're gonna get the same answer regardless for figuring out that. So I've got the diameter. If I wanna use that first formula, I need to half that diameter to turn it into a radius. So just dividing, dividing that number by two, the radius is 1.875 inches. So that's from the center of the piston out to the outer edge. So I'm gonna use that radius in my formula and figure out how many square inches we got. A Couple of options here for how you could lay the formula out. You could use the pi button on a calculator. I'm just gonna use 3.14, so you might get a slightly different answer than I if you use the pi button and we went to more decimal places. And then you could also square, the, if you had a square button on your calculator, you could use that to uh, square the radius. I'm just gonna multiply it by itself. Just keep this formula looking nice and simple. I'm just gonna multiply 3.14 times 1.875 times 1.875 again. It's all multiplication. There's no bed mass to worry about or anything like that. So I multiply that out. I get 11.04 square inches. So if I divided the surface into one by one squares on that piston, uh, it'd be just a little bit over 11 of them. Uh, I actually had more decimal places, but I rounded that to 11.04 square inches. I'm just going to use two decimal places. You could use more for more accuracy, but this will get us where we need to get. Okay, more, more crude drawings, but if we're going to be retracting the cylinder, of course we're sending oil in to this surface here that oil can access, which is, again is an annulus or a donut. So we're going to have to figure out the donut area. In order to do that, we have to figure out the area of the rod and subtract that from the area of the piston. So we've already know our piston area. We'll figure out our ineffective area, the area of the rod that oil can't push on, and the difference will be the area of our annulus or donut. So let's go on and do the rod area. I don't need a calculator for that one because with the rod being a two inch diameter, the radius is one. So pi r squared, pi times one times one, I've got 3.14 square inches. So I'm gonna subtract that off of the 11.04. That will tell me how many square inches I've got on this side of the piston. So to put that formula into a visual, the donut area is gonna be equal to the piston area, all these square inches, minus the square inches of the rod, or the hole in the donut, where we don't have a surface available for oil to push on. So simple subtraction gives us a donut area on this surface of 7.9 square inches. So now we've got our piston area, 11.04. We've got our donut area, 7.9. We can use those now in our Pascal's Law formula to figure out the relationship between force pressure and area. So the best way to understand this relationship between force pressure and area now is to imagine this cylinder lifting a particular load. So on the, where the pin goes through this cylinder, we're gonna hook it up to some linkage and we're going to do a linear straight lift and we'll just look at how much load we need to lift uh, with this cylinder. So we'll use an example weight. Uh, if we put uh, 10,000 pounds of weight on here, then we can ask, you know, what type of pressure is it going to take in this port of the cylinder filling in this side, pushing on the piston side of the, uh, or the large effective area side of the piston to extend up and lift that weight of 10,000 pounds. So let's do that as an example. So you can look up Blaise Pascal's uh, definition of 
this relationship, but it can be explained pretty simply with a triangle because uh, with imperial units, we're dealing with pressure in pounds per square inch. So we're gonna have our force in pounds on top and we're gonna have our area in square inches. And then this whole triangle really is getting explained by the units pound per square inch because pounds of force per square inches, this line indicates division. So if you wanna know the pressure, you can just cover that. It's force over area. If you wanna know the force potential from a cylinder and you know the pressure in the area, well then those are on the bottom, you can multiply them. So what we're gonna be looking for though, we've already got a force given to us of 10,000 pounds. We know the area for the cylinder when it's extending. So all we need to do is plug those values in and that will tell us then with some simple division what the pressure is going to be. So I've just turned that now into a formula. We're looking for P, it's F divided by A. So pressure equals force over area. For, a, for our example weight of 10,000 pounds, that's the force the cylinder has to exert at the rod eye to lift that, that uh, weight. So that's the trickiest part of this whole thing is understanding that F or force is the mechanical force from the cylinder that's gonna overcome the weight. Uh, so there's nothing hydraulic outside of the cylinder, it's just mechanical force. Uh, inside the cylinder, we have some square inches of area that oil can push on, and then pressure is going to be uh, induced to lift that load. So that's why we call it load-induced pressure. What's gonna determine the pressure in the cylinder is the load and the area, and we're just gonna calculate it. So simple division tells us we're gonna have 905.8 PSI. You can round that off differently, but really 905 PSI is gonna be the pressure in that cylinder as it's lifting 10,000 pounds. So that's important to understand. If you're putting oil into this port of the cylinder to push on this end of the piston and it's extending and it's lifting, the only resistance to its movement is a weight of 10,000 pounds then the pressure will be 905.8 PSI. It can never be 906, it can never be 950, it can never be 1,000. The pressure is caused by the load in hydraulics. So if that cylinder is moving and overcoming the load of 10,000 pounds, then the pressure at that fitting where the hose comes in and delivers oil will be 905.8 PSI. Now I'm hesitating to put decimal points on these pressures because are you going to be able to tell on this gauge if you're measuring that pressure, if you're teed in there, you're not going to be able to tell if you've got 905 or 905.8. So we don't need to be that concerned about decimal places. Uh, you know, we've got, we're going to have approximately 900 PSI. The thickness of the needle on this gauge is probably 10 or 20 PSI at least. So we're not going to see uh, decimal accuracy on a, on a, certainly not on this type of pressure gauge, a board on tube type pressure gauge. But that explains the relationship when the cylinder is extending. Let's talk about what happens when it's retracting. Then of course the oil is going in this fitting, coming into the tube, getting in between the gland and the piston, trying to drive the piston back. Now we could talk about the load this cylinder would be pulling. Let's say we hang this cylinder upside down and we're going to ask it to lift with this eye on the rod, we're gonna ask it to lift 10,000 pounds. So pushing oil into here, less surface area to work with, how's that gonna affect the pressure if we ask the cylinder to do the same work in that direction? So I've just laid that out, I've just taken that same Pascal's Law triangle. Pressure again equals force divided by area. The, the force is the same. We're gonna ask the cylinder to lift 10,000 pounds, but because we're doing it with the on the retraction, Function of the cylinder, we're doing it with the donut or annulus area, which is only 7.9 square inches. So our mass is gonna be different, our pressure is gonna be higher. So if we ask that same cylinder to lift 10,000 pounds in retraction, the pressure required to do that is gonna be 1265.8 PSI, 1265. Higher pressure, higher pressure pounds per square inch because there's less square inches. So again, the unit of pressure has this whole Pascal's Law equation in it. So here we only had each square inch of piston area, here only has to lift 905 pounds. So we got 905 PSI. 
Here, each square inch of area on the donut side, because there's less square inches, has to lift more weight. So we got 1,265 PSI, or pounds, per each of these 7.9 square inches. So that's one way we can work Pascal's Law. If we want to know the pressure required to lift a certain load with a certain size double-acting cylinder, we can see the, the pressure required to extend against that type of, res of physical resistance to, to movement, and we can see the pressure required for the cylinder to move against that same load in retraction. So extending and retraction. So I put extend here, and this will be retract. So the engineers that build equipment understand the, the functions of these cylinders and they understand that there's stronger pushing and weaker pulling and they engineer the movement of the machine around that concept. Of course, when the cylinder's retracting, because it's got less area, over its stroke length, it's also going to have less volume. So the, if you put oil in at a certain flow rate, it's going to go faster. If you put oil in the cylinder to extend it, it's going to go slower if you're feeding it the same rate of flow in each direction. So again, they build the machine around that concept. So just demonstrating that, if I retract this cylinder, see it comes back pretty quick. If I extend it, it goes out rather slowly. So that's another unbalanced double acting cylinder. It extends slowly. That's because I'm feeding it with the same pump in each direction. It's only got a certain amount of flow coming out and I'm just sending that flow either to this end to extend it or I'm sending it to this hose to retract it. And of course, when it retracts, the shiny rod is coming in there and filling up a good volume of that cylinder. So it takes less oil to move that back and retract it. And so it comes back faster. When we're extending it out, we have to fill the whole volume of the tube so it extends rather slowly. Another way we could be asked to apply Pascal's law to this cylinder, we could be giving, given a maximum system pressure. Of course, most basic systems have a main relief valve, and that re main relief valve is going to limit maximum system pressure that would ever be available to a cylinder like this to either the port for retracting or extending. And if it's the main relief that's limiting the, the pressure in both directions, we could be asked what's the maximum lift capacity of this cylinder or what's the maximum pulling capacity as it retracts. So to get the maximum amount of force available from this cylinder, we'd have to know the main release setting. And for discussion purposes, we'll say that the uh, maximum pressure in the system is 2000 PSI. And for, so for an example, we'll say if this system has a maximum pressure of 2000 PSI for this particular cylinder, what will be the maximum force in pounds extending? What will be the maximum force in pounds retracting? And of course, we're going to prove that it's weaker retracting than it is extending. So let's do the math on that. So for this cylinder, again, we're going to use the effective areas, but now we're going to look at the, what's our force maximum at our maximum pressure with the area given on the cylinder. So for extending, let's do that math again. We're gonna say our pressure at maximum is 2,000 PSI. So for extending, if our maximum pressure is 2,000 PSI, we've got 11.04 square inches of area it can push on. We're gonna multiply it, because here we're looking for force. Force is pressure times area. So force equals 2,000 PSI times the square inches of area gives us 22,080 pounds. So at that pressure, that's the maximum lift capacity right at the pin on the end of the rod of that cylinder. So for retracting, again, we're gonna talk maximums. If our pressure is limited to 2,000 PSI, we've got our force equals P times A again from our triangle, and in this case, 2,000 PSI times only 7.9 square inches. So 2,000 times 7.9 square inches, 15,800 pounds retracting. So that cylinder, at that limitation of maximum pressure, 22,080 uh, 22, pounds of pushing force and only 15,800 pounds of retraction. So not only does that demonstrate the effect of Pascal's law or the relationship between force pressure and area in a cylinder, but it also explains the how the main relief valve or maximum system pressure, if adjusted correctly or incorrectly, can affect the lift capacity or retraction force uh, on a particular hydraulic implement. So the, uh, the, the force is right at this pin 
or at this pin where this barrel of the cylinder is pinned, the force on that pin, of course, at 2,000 PSI, is going to be 22,080 pounds in that direction. When it's pulling back, 15,800 pounds.